Hi guys! In the next video, we're going to have a look at an introduction to alkanes, bonding in alkanes, the intermolecular forces of attraction, trends in the boiling points of our alkanes, the reactivity of our alkanes, reactions our alkanes undergo, looking at combustion, the products of combustion, radical substitution, catalytic converters, an exam style question, and finally, a summary. So let's have a look at what are alkanes. Well, you may well have met alkanes before. Alkanes are hydrocarbons, and what we mean by that is they're composed only of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Alkanes are saturated. What we mean by that is they contain only single carbon to carbon bonds. So here we have an example of an alkane. You can see it's composed only of carbon and hydrogen atoms, and there are only single carbon to carbon bonds. We can go ahead and name this alkane. We have one, two, three, four, five carbon atoms in the chain. So the stem is going to be pent. Now we know that the suffix for our alkanes is ane. So this is pentane. Our alkanes form a homologous series. By that we mean they have a general formula. And the general formula for our alkanes is CnH2n plus 2, where n is the number of carbon atoms in our molecule. And within our homologous series, we see a gradation in the physical and chemical properties. So alkanes can be straight chain, and by straight chain we mean exactly that, there's a straight chain of carbon atoms. So here we have a straight chain alkane. This has one, two, three, four, five carbons. It is pentane as we saw above. We can also get branch chain alkanes. So this alkane, as you can see here, has a branch, a branched group. So this group over here makes our alkane branched. So the longest carbon chain is one, two, three, four carbons long. So the stem is going to be but. Now we can see that on our second carbon, we have this branch. The branch has only one carbon in. It is a methyl group. So the prefix is going to be methyl. And the locant of our prefix will be two, as the methyl is on the second carbon. So we have two methyl butane. We can also get cyclic alkanes. Here we have a acetyl formula for a cyclic alkane containing one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, telling us the stem is going to be hex. As it's an alkane, the suffix will be ane. Now, as it's cyclic, we have cyclohexane. So now I've had a look at what are alkanes, let's take a closer look at the bonding within the alkanes. So we know that our alkanes are hydrocarbons. They are made of carbon and hydrogen atoms only. Now we know our carbon atoms have an electronic arrangement of two, four. That's two electrons in the innermost shell and four in the outermost shell. Now, as our carbon atoms have four electrons in the outermost shell, they can form four covalent bonds. Now, the bonds they form are sigma bonds because they involve the direct overlapping of orbitals. And using methane, the most simple alkane as an example, we see in the alkane structure, every carbon atom has a tetrahedral shape. And we know the bond angle to be 109.5 degrees as we know is true of our tetrahedral shapes. And this is because of the electron repulsion that occurs. So now I've looked at the bonding within our alkanes, let's have a look at the intermolecular force of attraction between the molecules. So below I have a periodic table showing the electronegativity of the elements. Well, if we have a look, carbon and hydrogen have very similar values of electronegativity. We can see that hydrogen over here has a value of 2.1 and carbon over here a value of 2.5. So because these values are so similar, our alkane molecules are not polar. So instead, we have weak intermolecular forces of attraction occurring between alkane molecules. Now, these occur because of the constant movement of electrons that allow for temporary dipoles to occur. And just like dominoes knock over their neighbour, they induce these temporary dipoles in neighbouring molecules. And we know that as a result, London forces of attraction occur. So let's have a look now at the trends that we see within our alkanes, specifically the trends in the boiling points. We see a trend in the boiling point of our alkanes, as you can see here. As the number of carbon atoms increases, the boiling point increases. So let's begin by having a look at, the, at how the length of the carbon chain impacts the boiling point of our alkanes. Well, as the alkanes increase in length, their relative molecular mass increases too. The molecules become larger. So if we compare methane and hexane, methane is the first in the series of alkanes. 
Methane has a molecular mass of 16. Whereas hexane, which is much larger, has a relative molecular mass of 86. If we look at the boiling point of methane compared to hexane, we'll see the boiling point of methane is minus 162 degrees Celsius, and that of hexane is 69 degrees Celsius. So hexane is larger and has a higher boiling point. But why is this? Well, it's because the larger molecules have a greater surface area. So there's a greater degree of surface area contact between adjacent molecules. We have our methane and our hexane drawn out for us, and we can see how much larger the surface area of our hexane molecule will be. So as a result of this, the London forces increase. More energy is required to overcome the increasingly strong intermolecular forces of attraction. And so therefore overall we see that as the chain length increases, the boiling point does too. Another factor that's important in influencing the boiling point of our alkanes is the branching of the carbon chain. We had a look at how alkanes can be branched. And the more branching a molecule has, the less surface area over which intermolecular interactions are able to occur. What we mean by that is essentially the molecules are not able to fit together as well. So if we compare two alkanes which have the same molecular formula, both pentane and methylbutane have a molecular formula of C5H12. Pentane is a straight chain alkane, whereas methylbutane is branched. Now, whilst pentane has a boiling point of 36.1 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of the branched methylbutane is 27.8 degrees Celsius. And this is because more branched molecules have a lower degree of London forces. The more branching in the molecule, the lower the boiling point. So we can see that it is not only the carbon chain length, but it's also the degree of branching that affects the boiling point of our alkane. So our alkanes have a relatively low reactivity. Here we have pentane, the fifth alkane within our series with five carbon atoms. Now, as previously mentioned, the carbon-hydrogen bond within our alkane has a low polarity. The sigma bonds have a low polarity. And this is because the electronegativity values of our carbon and hydrogen are so similar. The bonds within our alkanes have large bond enthalpies. They require lots of energy to break them, meaning that our alkanes are relatively unreactive. If we have a look, though, at some of the reactions they do undergo, our alkanes can be combusted. So during the process of combustion, oxygen from the air is combined with our alkane, and it's quite a rapid process. And for this reason, alkanes are frequently used as, or as a component of, fuels. So through combustion, their chemical energy is transferred to thermal energy, where it's more useful. And alkanes can be completely and incompletely combusted. There are two slightly different reactions that occur. In complete combustion, which occurs in excess air, the maximum amount of energy is transferred. You may have visualised this already. When the air hole of our Bunsen burners is open, you'll see the Bunsen burner burns with a clean blue flame. The oxygen supply from the air is plentiful. However, incomplete combustion can also occur, and this occurs in a limited supply of air. In contrast to the clean blue flame, when the hole is open, when we close the hole in our Bunsen burner, the air supply is restricted and we'll see the Bunsen burner burns with a dirty yellow flame. This is incomplete combustion. Now these two different reactions produce slightly different products. So let's take a look at those products now. Let's begin by looking at the product of complete combustion. Well, the first product is water. Now the formation of water is really not an issue because it just adds to the world's existing water supplies. The other product is carbon dioxide. Now producing carbon dioxide is not ideal as carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Increasing levels of carbon dioxide are thought to be responsible for increasing global temperatures. And increasing global temperatures have allowed for consequences such as the melting of the polar ice caps and the rising of seawater levels. The reaction also produces a few other products. These include carbon. So solid carbon can be formed through the process of incomplete combustion, which we'll observe as soot a sooty flame. Carbon monoxide may also be formed. Now carbon monoxide is a colourless and odourless gas. It's known as the silent killer because of its undetectable yet deadly nature. So carbon monoxide prevents the effective transport of oxygen around the body. It does this by binding to your haemoglobin in place of oxygen and preventing the effective carriage of oxygen around your blood. Apart from carbon monoxide and carbon, Unburned hydrocarbons also exist in the product of incomplete combustion. 
Now, in addition, the impurities in our alkanes may lead to the formation of different products. Oxides of sulfur may be produced if atoms of sulfur are contained in the initial hydrocarbon molecules. Now, the fuels are usually processed through processes such as fractional distillation and cracking, although they may not remove all of the impurities. So if we have sulphur present in the hydrocarbon molecules, the alkanes that we burn, sulphur, sulphur dioxide and sulphur trioxide may be formed in combustion. Now these gases are acidic oxides and when they dissolve in water they form sulfuric and sulfurous acid and contribute to acid rain. Acid rain is incredibly damaging not only to wildlife and crops but also to buildings and architectural statues. Fuels may also be contaminated with nitrogen. So combustion of nitrogen containing alkanes will lead to the formation of nitrogen oxides. These include nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, which in a similar way to the oxides of sulfur can dissolve in water to further worsen the problem of acid rain. So as we can see, many of the products of incomplete combustion are not ideal. And that's why catalytic converters are so important. So what are our catalytic converters? Catalytic converters are fitted to the exhaust of road vehicles. They use precious metals such as, such as platinum, rhodium and palladium, which are thinly spread over a mesh, as you can see in our diagram here. Gases pass over the catalyst. These include gases such as carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides. They're converted into less harmful gases such as nitrogen, water and carbon dioxide. Some of the reactions that occur in our catalytic converters include the conversion of carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide and the conversion of harmful nitrogen monoxide. Alkanes are able to react with halogens, specifically chlorine and bromine in UV light. Now the reaction forms halogenated organic compounds and the mechanism of this reaction is a radical substitution reaction. We'll take a look at the three steps of initiation, propagation and termination now. So the first step is the initiation reaction. If we have a look at the chlorination of methane. So in the first step, the radicals are formed. So we have diatomic chlorine forming our free radicals through homolytic fission. The second step is our propagation step. Reactions occur to build up our products. So we have a molecule of chlorine, CH4, reacting with a free radical, our chlorine free radical, to form a CH3 free radical and hydrogen chloride. We can have that CH3 free radical go on to react with a molecule of chlorine to form chloromethane and reform that chlorine radical. Now, this step is much like a domino reaction because this methyl radical that's formed in the first step can go on to take part in the second propagation reaction, which forms a chlorine free radical, which can go on to take part in the first propagation reaction. And we can see how these reactions could repropagate themselves. So the third step is the termination step. This is where two radicals collide to form a stable product. So we could have two of our chlorine free radicals colliding to form a molecule of chlorine. We could have two methyl free radicals reacting to form ethane, C2H6. Or we could have a methyl free radical reacting with a chlorine free radical to form chloromethane. Now we've looked at all three steps of the reaction, the initiation, propagation and termination. But it's important to realise this reaction is limited in its utility. And that's because not only do we produce this mixture of products, go ahead and be reused in the reaction. Further substitution reactions also occur. These form more substituted alkanes as well as longer chain alkanes. Examples include the reaction of our chloromethyl free radical with our chlorine free radical to form dichloromethane, as well as the reaction of our methyl free radical with our ethyl free radical to form propane. Now, in reality, this is not a good method for the industrial preparation of chloromethane, CH3Cl, as the yield is low and the product has to be separated, removing our desired products from this mixture of products. The alkanes are a homologous series, and they should be a homologous series we're very familiar with. Give the general formula of an alkane. 
Well, this is a question you will have come across time and time again, and it's something you should know off the top of your head. The general formula of our alkanes we know to be CnH2n plus 2, getting us that quick and easy mark. Moving on to part B, we're asked to draw the display formula for all of the isomers of the first three members of the alkane homologous series. So we can start with the first member, which we know will be C. H4. We can use our formula to tell us that, or you may know it already. So that's quite simple. The display formula will look something like this. There we go. And the second member will be C2H6, ethane. We can go ahead and draw that. We've got our two carbons and then our hydrogens. And the third member, C3H8, with our three carbons and then our hydrogens. And there's no other way we could organize those carbons in our different members there. So that is all we need to do. We have methane, ethane, and propane. In part C, we're asked to state and explain the trend in boiling points for the alkanes. So firstly, let's go ahead and state the trend in boiling points. We know that boiling point increases as the number of carbons in the carbon chain, or N, increases. So now we've stated the trend, we need to go on to explain it. Now we know that larger alkanes, so those that have a longer carbon chain length, have a larger surface area. And this allows a greater surface area over which London forces of attraction to act. And that is why our boiling point increases. I've gone ahead and explained that larger alkanes have a larger surface area over which stronger London forces of attraction can act. So we get our first mark for explaining the boiling point increases as the length of carbon chain, or N, increases, stating the trend. And the next two marks are held in the explanation. Firstly, for explaining that larger alkanes have a larger surface area. And the final mark is given for explaining that this means that stronger London forces of attraction can act over this larger surface area. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap of my smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.